Jeremy Paul Gallagher and I'm the student body president and on behalf of the students here at UCSD I would like to thank you all for coming I would also like to thank the Baha'i Club for letting us use the space that they had reserved and also most importantly I would like to thank Senator John Kerry for coming today What I hear a lot is people tell me that students are apathetic and that students are looking for easy. Yeah. It'd be easy if students didn't show up for this today. <laughs> no, Bush did not tell me that. Uh, it'd be easy if students didn't organize against issues that threaten diversity and health in California. It'd be easy for students not to attend this university. It'd be easy for us not to incur thousands and thousands of dollars in debt. How many students here are in debt already? Okay, okay. When the fires hit San Diego just a few months ago, it'd be easy if the students sat at home and, didn't, and saw it on the news and didn't relate to it. But as thousands of students across the state have organized against issues of diversity and access. And as hundreds of UCSD students volunteered to help fight the fires in clinics and in shelters, and as, as hundreds of students raised thousands of dollars, I know that students are not looking for easy. But it can't stop there. We must continue the fight. Let me put the question to you. Who here is ready to join in the fight for what they believe in? Who here is ready to educate themselves and make a change of the status quo for the better? Looking at today's economy, the status quo is not good enough. The economy can no longer sustain access to education at the level it is. But fortunately, fortunately, there's somebody here today who can help change the economy. Not just of our great state, but of our great nation. But before the senator comes up, I would like to introduce Jared Brown, an environmental activist here on campus to talk a little bit about those issues. Please welcome Jared Brown. Give it up. Woo! Thank you, Jeremy. How you guys doing tonight? Today, excuse me. All right, all of us here have heard the analogy that this earth is like a giant spaceship, right? We heard it in elementary school and so forth, but unfortunately, this metaphor always seemed like a distant reality, like some kind of far away land, something that's going to be a problem in some distant tomorrow. However, I stand here before you today to assure you that this problem is not for some distant tomorrow. This is a problem today. We need to act aggressively today, not tomorrow, to save this great spaceship from falling under a shortfall. Now, you know that for six days, gas prices across America have hit record highs. Across the nation, the gas prices have hit $1.75 per gallon. But here, obviously, in California, you see they are much, much, much higher. In the current, imagination, uh, current administration, the Bush administration has <laughs> they, 
They have done nothing, nothing to decrease the demand of foreign oil. The current administration recognizes that even with 65% of the Earth's oil being in the Persian Gulf and only 3% of the oil being here in America, they have done nothing to decrease the demand on foreign oil. I stand here to tell you that John Kerry can decrease the demand on foreign oil. He has an effective plan. Mr. Kerry recognizes the importance, the need, the necessity to invest research in renewable sources of energy. We need to invest in sources of energy like solar, wind, geothermal, water, and hydrogen sources of energy. This is not an option for our future, folks. This is a necessity. John Kerry is ready, willing, and capable to lead this country and the world into a better environmentally conservative world. Senator Kerry, Senator Kerry has the record, the experience, and the ability to protect our environment. The recent water crisis in Washington, D.C., where regular everyday citizens like you and myself were asked to stop drinking the water because it was too polluted with lead. That is a crisis, folks. And the current administration, the Bush administration, has done nothing about it. John Kerry has laid out an effective plan to eliminate Bush rollbacks on the environment on water pollution, on air pollution, and in the forest. We need a leader. America needs a leader that is willing to work for a better, cleaner America. And that person, ladies and gentlemen, is who? John Kerry! There you go! Now, I'd like to... Now I'd like to introduce another Kerry, a fellow student, and also a very active environmentalist. I want to introduce Vanessa Kerry. Come on down. Thank you very, very much. Thank you. All right, you all are officially the biggest crowd I've ever spoken in front of. Thank you. This is awesome. Um, it's great to be in San Diego. Last time I was here was in December, and what a difference three months will make. <laughs> uh, it, this is my school vacation. It is great to be out here. I get to campaign. Thanks, Dad. Um, and it's sort of a role reversal, considering he spent years coming to my sports games, and now I'm here doing his rallies, so we're reversing. But Seriously, I am in medical school and it is great to see everyone out here for the environment for all the reasons we are out here because um, being in med school has shown me directly some of the ways that we need to see a change in administration. And so it is a huge, huge honor to see all, everyone out here standing here to stand with us and to fight to win in November. And we are going to win because we have to win. And we're going to do it with everybody's help. We're going to get out the vote. We're going to fight back. We're going to speak the truth. And we are going to win. <laughs> Sorry? <laughs> All right, moving on. So. <laughs> <laughs> the man, the person you've all been waiting for, I just want to say a quick note about my dad because I think I grew up with him knowing his idealism firsthand, seeing it, and it's a big part of what he wants to see return to this country again. So everybody please welcome my father, Senator John Kerry. <laughs>
this place. Woo! How are you? How are you? It is great to see you. How are you? Look at you way back up there. I want you all to I want you to cheer for all the people who are way back there. Look at them up there. Now I want to hear you back there cheer for all the people up here. Oh, uh, you're not as good as they are up here. I'm Hello, University of California, San Diego. How are you? The Tritons. It is so great to be here. Will you, will you join me in thanking my daughter? I'm so proud of her. Vanessa Carey, thank you. Thank you very much. But we have to, we have to, we have to do something on November 2nd to make that happen, okay? Let me tell you something. I, this is very special for me. I love coming to San Diego because, uh, because I spent a lot of time here in my misspent youth. I had a great time here. This, uh, I used to live out on Pacific Beach. You know. And I gotta tell you something, I was walking through the Price Center a moment ago and I saw this sign on the wall and it said U.S. News and World Report ranked University of California, San Diego in the top ten public college universities in America. And that's important. But it also said it ranked uh, in the uh, tops in a bunch of graduate programs, drama and a whole bunch of others, and that's important, but it said the most important thing of all, Sports Illustrated said, best school for surfing. And that's why, and I kid you not, every day I was training, I was training over at Coronado, and uh, I lived on Pacific Beach, and every day when we finished training at Coronado, I'd come back over to Pacific Beach and we'd surf for three or four hours. And, uh, and I went to La Jolla a couple of times and caught the cove there and it was really great. I gotta tell you something, folks. Life was really hard in the military when I was here doing all of that. It was tough. I'm glad to be here with you. I was in Sacramento yesterday, drove down to San Diego. It was beautiful. But I did notice the gasoline prices. And then I got here in San Diego and we stopped briefly at a gas station, $2.37 for premium, $2.20 or so for regular, and rising. I'll tell you what, if the gas prices keep rising at the rate they're going now, Dick Cheney and George Bush are going to have to carpool to work. Those... Those, those aren't Exxon prices. Those are Halliburton prices, ladies and gentlemen. Now, just today and yesterday, the Bush administration's launched a new set of attack advertisements, and they're attacking on the issue of taxes and gas prices. This is the biggest single say one thing, do another administration in the modern history of our country. Instead of, instead of revealing a new set of attack ads, I think Dick Cheney ought to reveal who the oil executives are that he met in secret with to set the oil policy of the United States of America. And they ought to explain why the chief economist of this administration said in the New York Times a couple of years ago that we ought to be raising the gasoline taxes in the United States of America. We need an energy policy that's real and honest for this country. And the fact is, the fact is that this administration, when it was running, talked about how the, how the Clinton administration hadn't done enough with OPEC in order to create the supplies that we need to keep the prices down. This administration 
has done nothing with OPEC to reduce the gas prices. In addition to that, we should be taking steps right now, and here's exactly what I'll do. Number one, we should be putting pressure on OPEC to raise the supply and not allow those countries to undermine the economies of the world. Number two, we should stop momentarily, which is what we have always done previously, filling the petroleum, the strategic, uh, strategic petroleum reserve. We should stop diverting that so the supply to the economy and to the country is higher, which brings price down. And finally, there are 300 separate jurisdictions about additives to gasoline across the country. That raises the price of gasoline. If we were to simplify those rules and regulations, which we could do, we can lower the price of gas in the United States of America. And finally, and finally, and most importantly, we deserve an administration that doesn't fake it to the American people and pretend that somehow by drilling in the Alaska Wildlife Refuge, we can deal with the problems of America. We can't provide the supply of oil America needs from the Alaska Wildlife Refuge or from any other source in the United States because we only have 3% of the world's oil reserves. And so, as President, I pledge to you, I will put in place the principle, long since overdue, that no young American in uniform ought to ever be held hostage to America's dependence on oil for the Middle East. We need to liberate ourselves. This, this is a matter of common sense. There are a lot of smart people standing out here. You're all, you're all part of a university that's one of the great research universities in the United States. We pour, we pour an enormous amount of federal funding into this university and others. The state puts money into it. We need to use the entrepreneurial and creative scientific skill of this country to begin to embark on a new mission. And as president, I intend to ask America to go on that journey long since overdue. If you only have 3% of the world's oil reserves, and the Middle East has 65%, and we import more than 58% or so and rising of our oil from other countries, it is obvious, any child in grade school can do the math. The United States of America can't drill its way out of this predicament. We have to invent our way out of it. And the sooner we get about the business of doing it, I pledge, I pledge to you that we will create in the first four years of my administration, the uh, first four years, a little slow on the uptake. In the first four years, we will create 500,000 new jobs by setting a goal for America that by the year 2020, 20% 20 of our electricity is going to be produced by alternative and renewable sources in this country. And we can achieve that. And, and I'll tell you, during the late 1970s, when President Carter and the country suffered the first onslaught of gas surge because of the problems of supply being cut off, we started down that road. We created an energy institute in Colorado tenured professors left their positions and went out there to create the future I just talked about. And we were the world's leaders in alternative and renewable energy. And then along came the Reagan administration and out of ideology, <laughs> out of ideology, out of ideology, they dragged the money away. They sucked it out. They put tenured professors back in the street. They reduced America's lead. And that lead went to Germany, and it went to Japan, 
And so when the Iron Curtain fell and the Soviet Union went down, and all of a sudden these communist bloc countries were coming out of years of communism and the devastation of their environment that came with it, they turned and looked for those technologies not to the United States, but to Germany and Japan and other places. We can put America to work if we commit ourselves again to science and technology and discovery and produce the jobs of the future that are there for all of you when you come out of college. And let me tell you something else we need to do. All of you, when you leave this place, are hoping to find a job by which allows you to do better. And today in America, more and more students are leaving colleges, more and more burdened with loans. And some people, because those loans are so great, have to make a life decision about what kind of work to go into rather than what they might like to go into just to be able to pay it down. I believe we ought to start to make it possible for no young person in America to ever have to downsize their dreams because of the cost of education. And because of that, and so, and so I have a plan, and here it is. For those who wonder specifically what I will do, I have a different vision from George Bush. He and I both graduated, he and I both graduated from a university of privilege on the East Coast, but we left with very different visions about how you allow every other American to have the same kind of opportunity. He has presided over cuts. He has presided over cuts in the Pell Grants, cuts in the Perkins loans and Stafford loans. And we have too many students that I've met across the country who've told me, Senator, I couldn't go to the college of my choice because I couldn't afford it even though I was accepted. I don't think that should happen, and so here's what I will do. Number one, I will provide a $4,000 tuition tax credit to reduce the burden of those tuitions so people can afford to go to school. Number two, number two, we're going to have a pay-down program so that young people who want to take advantage of going into teaching in an urban center where there's a low tax base or teaching in a rural community that can't afford to raise the salaries so you can pay down your loans. We're going to ask you to come and do that work and child care and other worthy things and we will help pay down the student loans in exchange for taking on those kinds of jobs. And finally, and finally, in keeping with the spirit of service in our country, I want young people who graduate from high school who are facing difficult choices about how to pay for college education to be able to give something back to their community and have their community join them in that effort. So for any graduate of high school, and we'll have to start modestly because of the deficit that this administration has created and our responsibility not to shoulder it onto you, we need to do it, but we will provide a program that says to any graduate of high school, if you'll take two years and stay in your community and work in your community, help kids who are at risk, help kids who don't have adults at home until late in the evening and provide safety and nurturing and, and, and mentoring, if you will provide seniors who are shut in with an opportunity to be able to share in the world around them, for those kinds of work and so much more, we, in return, are going to pay for your full in-state four-year college public education. And that is a worthwhile effort in this country. I'll tell you what else we're going to do. We're going to apply common sense to the economy of this country. I'm tired of hearing from Americans of all walks of life who tell me, Senator, I'm working two jobs, three jobs. We still can't get ahead. Tuitions go up, health care goes up, gas goes up. All the costs around us go up. The one thing that doesn't go up that ought to go up are the wages of Americans who are working. And so, and what we need to do is make America more competitive with steps of common sense. This administration believes that outsourcing is just dandy, that it's good for America and fine and acceptable. Well, 
I will say to you that no American president, no president could possibly stop all the outsourcing, but I'll tell you what we can do. We can make this workplace more fair and more sensible by not asking American workers, literally, to subsidize the loss of their own job. Today, in the tax code of our country, if you're a business doing business here in San Diego, and you earn a profit, that profit will be taxed at the standard corporate rate in the United States. But if that same company were to go abroad, guess what? They get to defer that income and then they can defer it the next year and the next year so there's an incentive never to repatriate that money there's an incentive to go offshore I don't think it makes sense George Bush does and when I'm president we will take away any incentive for Americans to pay for the loss of their own jobs Let me tell you what else we need to do. We also need to create those jobs here in our country. We are the country of science, usually. This is the worst science administration in the modern history of our nation. And I believe, I believe we need to recommit America to all of our scientific endeavors and the critical technologies and begin to create the high value added jobs of the future. We need to do stem cell research and reduce the illnesses and diseases. And we need to reduce the cost of health care for individuals and businesses alike. Once again, once again, I will be specific. George Bush has had four years to lay before America a four, well, we got five of you here and about 5,000 others who don't think so, so that's all right. But, now I ask you, all of you, you be the judge. Healthcare didn't just start to be a problem this year. When George Bush became president, 41 million Americans didn't have any health care at all. Now, four million more Americans don't have health care under George Bush. And I believe it is our responsibility to stop being the only industrial nation on the face of this planet that doesn't understand that health care is not a privilege for the rich and the powerful and the connected. It is a right for all Americans, and we're going to make it available. Now, you have a right to say to me, okay, Senator, you've laid out an education plan, you've laid out a health care plan, You've got these things you want to do. How are we going to pay for them? And I'll tell you exactly how we're going to pay for them. We are going to reduce the deficit in half in four years. We'll do exactly what we did in the 1990s without one Republican vote when we provided this country with the lowest inflation, the lowest unemployment, the highest rate of hiring women and women-owned businesses in America, the highest rate the highest rate of lifting people out of poverty, the first increase in wages at every single level of the country, and we not only, we not only balanced our budget, we paid down the debt of our nation for two years in a row, and we created 23 million new jobs while we did it. So, so I pledge to you that we will create 10 million new jobs, and we will do it by believing in America, by believing in the possibilities of our ability to continue to push the curve of discovery, by making a fair playing field so that our workers are not literally put on a disadvantage with other countries on a permanent basis. I will negotiate trade agreements that begin to put labor standards and environment standards and raise the ability of Americans to work on a fair field. And most importantly, we deserve a President of the United States who understands how to make America stronger and safer in this world without
I believe, and I know there's some veterans here who share this with me. I believe that one of the most solemn responsibilities of the Commander-in-Chief is how you take a nation to war. And what you do with respect to those young people who serve in the armed forces. Today, this administration, even as it talks about patriotism, has presided over a $1.8 billion cut in the VA budget. There are tens of thousands of veterans waiting months to be able to see a doctor for the first time, just to be able to get their prescription drugs signed off on. There are over 400,000 veterans in a category who have been eliminated altogether from applying to the VA. There are countless numbers of veterans, about 90,000, waiting for admission. And all across this country, veterans understand the way in which, even as we create a new generation of veterans, the promise has been broken. I'll tell you that we deserve a president who understands the first definition of patriotism is keeping faith with those who wore the uniform of our country. And I will do that. And finally, if you look around the world today, you will hear from people and see and read about a world that is waiting for the United States of America to live up to its ideals, to live up to its values, to lead the world in ways that we have traditionally. This administration ignored North Korea for two years in a row. They took a situation where we had television cameras and inspectors inside the reactors, and today they're not in the reactors, and it's a more dangerous world. We have a world where for, 100 and, for, for, for 160 nations, they labored for 10 years to put together a global warming treaty. It was flawed, but despite the flaw, it was fixable. This administration, instead of going to the table and trying to fix it, declared it dead. I believe we deserve a president and an administration that works for all of humankind and for our planet to be responsible about global warming and to lead the world with respect to those issues. <laughs> Staring us in the face on a global basis is one of the great moral crises of all time, AIDS. And it is not just an issue that is confined to Africa. It is in the Caribbean, it's in India, it's in China, it's in uh, Asia, it's in uh, Russia today. It's pandemic. And the experts tell us that the, the apex of death from AIDS will not occur until the year 2035 or 2040. We have yet to see the full measure of human devastation that may come unless we lead and the world steps up and deals with a comprehensive plan on education and training, infrastructure, human infrastructure, vaccine development, prevention, treatment, all of the components that will change a behavior and save lives. There are today 15 million orphans already. There are some 40 million people HIV positive infected. No one can avoid responsibility to begin to become part of this, but this administration has. They've been toying at the edges, playing politics, rhetorical response, and we deserve a president who helps to lead the world to deal with this moral issue now. We also deserve a president who doesn't talk about terror and then turn his back on Homeland Security. Today, two-thirds of the firehouses in America are understaffed. 50% of the firefighters in America don't have the communications equipment they need. In our port security, we inspect only about 4% of the containers that come into the country. And any expert will tell you you've got to reach 10 to 20% to begin to get deterrence. We have tunnels and bridges and all kinds of public facilities, chemical plants, nuclear facilities that remain still the kinds of targets they were on September 11th. And I know one thing, we should not be opening firehouses in Baghdad and shutting them in the United States of America. So, 
If you measure what this administration has done in the extraordinary gap in intelligence that was provided to our country, in the misstatements that were made to America in the course of State of the Union messages and other announcements of this administration, if you look around the world at our reputation and our influence that are in tatters, this administration has run the most arrogant and reckless unilateral foreign policy in the modern history of our country. And it is a matter of urgency. Urgency for the security of our nation. Urgency for our responsibilities in the world, for your future. The war on terror is best fought, not just by using the military when you need to, but it is best fought by having the best intelligence and the best law enforcement in the world, and that requires the greatest cooperation we've ever had with other countries, and that is one thing this administration does worst. I pledge to you, I pledge to you that on behalf of our nation and the world that is waiting, Within weeks of being inaugurated, if you will trust me with the presidency, I will... I... Thank you. Thank you. Thank you for trusting me. Now we have to actually go out and win it. How's that? But, but if you trust me with the presidency, within weeks, I will return to the United Nations and on, on our behalf, because I believe that multilateralism is not a mark of weakness, it is a sign of strength, I will on behalf of all Americans and all those people waiting for leadership, we will rejoin the community of nations and we will turn over, we will turn over a proud new chapter in America's relationship with the world that makes us safer and stronger and more secure. Let me just close by saying this to all of you, those of you up on the hill, those of you here. I want to talk to all of you on a personal level for a moment. <laughs> That's all right. They, they, they're fine. They're doing great. They're doing great. I'm glad they're here. I really am. I'm glad they're here because because they are here and open-minded, they are going to learn a lot today. So I'm glad they're here. But let me just say this. I've been fighting for our country now for 35 years. And I've seen the ups and downs of American politics. I came into this great journey in the 1960s during the Civil Rights Movement. And it was young people, just like every single one of you standing here, who became the frontline troops in that effort. It was young people who stood up about the war in Vietnam and changed the course of history as they knocked on doors and handed out leaflets. It was young people who were the leaders of the marches for equality for women in America, a march that is still not finished and which we need to complete. It was young people who responded to rivers that were on fire in America, responded to toxic chemicals that were poisoning young people and old alike, and marched for the environment and became part of the first Earth Day in 1970. And out of all of those efforts, out of all of those efforts, came real change. Now I know there's a cynicism. I know there's a sense of letdown. 
and people feel the impact of what happened in 2000 and some people think there's no difference between one or the other and some people think that the promises are just made to be broken I don't believe that I come to this race I come to this effort with as much idealism and as much passion and as much energy as I came to it in the 1960s and I believe that if we will start to make these things that matter to us health care environment long-term care social security medicare education our children our role in the world all of these things if we make them voting issues by going out and being involved in this process we will change the face of american politics will change the future will make a difference in this world when i came back when i came back from my first tour of duty in vietnam to this coast of california it was june 5th of 1968 and the first radio crackling that we picked up as we approached the shores of this great state were the reports from the ambassador hotel where robert kennedy had won a primary only to learn a few moments later of his assassination in the kitchen and the next morning as we docked we learned that that day he died and robert kennedy in the course of that campaign quoted the words of george bernard shaw and he asked the question some men see things as they are and ask why i dream things that never were and ask why not i believe we need to be a country and we need to be a party again and we need to be a people again who dare to stand up and ask why not why not make our politics what we want it to be why not believe that we can treat people fairly why not know that in america if you work a 40-hour work week you can actually take care of your family and pay your bills and live decently why not have health care for all americans why not stand up for civil rights and civil liberties and the right to choose and for an attorney general and stand up for an attorney general who is not john ashcroft i ask you to join me in these next months i don't have all the answers but i know how to listen and i know how to put people of good faith from any ideology at the table and find the genuine compromise this president started out calling himself the great uniter but i believe i believe he has become the great divider and let me say we deserve a president of the united states who does not traffic in prejudice against anyone in america including gays and lesbians we deserve we deserve a president who doesn't stand up and use the most sanctified cherished document in political history the constitution of the united states who doesn't use it for raw political purposes in an election year we need to protect the constitution so i'm asking you to join me this is our generation and your generation's moment to define our politics this is the most important election of a lifetime and i'm asking you to be part of it so that together we can reclaim america's prosperity america's truth america's strength let us go out together and win this election thank you and god bless